Test, Test, 1, 2. Servus.
Welcome. All right, I'd say we wait another uh, one minute. I see Carl is here now, um, but we wait just another one minute for uh, participants to arrive and then we'll start. Welcome, Carl. <laughs> uh, I don't hear you yet. Hello? Yep, now it's working. Okay. Amazing. Great. All right, and I think we can get started. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody to today's event. Uh, today's speaker is Carl Svensson, who is a security professional at the um, Google Offensive Security Team. And he's also an active CTF player himself. And in today's talk, he will give us an uh, introduction into binary exploitation. And then after the talk, we will have time for a Q&A session. And for that, we've prepared a website for which we will post a link into the chat in a, in a couple of seconds. And then you can go to that website and already start asking questions now. And if you want to ask your question personally in the Q&A session, then make sure to include your name on the website. And otherwise, if you want us to ask the question, then just do it anonymously. And also make sure to upvote other people's questions because that will be the order in which uh, we will ask the questions. And yeah, then without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Carl for the talk. Yeah, hello. Uh, I just uh, realized that there will be another minute. Uh, I'm on my uh, work computer, and apparently I'm not allowed to share my screen on Zoom meetings uh, from my computer. So right. I'm, just, I'm just booting up my uh, personal computer, and I'll just join the meeting uh, from there. So, uh, yeah, we can give it another um, sure. minute. That works.
Nope, we don't hear you yet. At least I don't. I think it's working now. Yeah. I okay. I heard no. it's like, yeah, yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, no. Then introduction is done already. So I'll hand it over to you right away. Yeah. Oh, no, it says the host of the meeting has disabled. Oh, okay. damn. Blame is on me. OK. Yeah. So maybe it wasn't my uh, computer anyway, at all. All right. All participants can share now. Uh, please, nobody else than Carl share the screen. <laughs> OK. So you can see that? Yep. Awesome. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. And welcome to this uh, presentation. I'm going to give you an introduction to the field of binary exploitation. Uh, before I start, just um, short about myself. Yeah, well, there was already a, a presentation. There's, here's that information again. Um, to note, though, if you want to get in touch after this presentation, uh, feel free to uh, send me an email. Uh, or uh, you know, if you want to get in contact uh, on Twitter, that uh, also works as well. Um, so what we're going to talk about uh, today, uh, first, we're just going to go through some, uh, some background materials that you will, like a, a small refresher and some computer science uh, concept that you will need to, uh, to make the most out of these materials. And then we will focus most of the presentation on um, Different like stack-based uh, exploits and the uh, protections around some of them, and uh, some of the bypasses and exploit uh, exploitation techniques that exist around there. And I will also talk a little bit about uh, heap-related exploitations and some of the con basic co concepts there. And uh, I'll finish it off with. Um, uh, talking about some resources where you can go if you want to learn more, if you want to try these things out, uh, and so on. And uh, yeah, I think we have a bunch of people in the talk and so on, right? So if there are questions, I mean, we will have time for questions at the end as well. But uh, if there is anything that's like unclear or something during the presentation, feel free to uh, interrupt me. Um, I'm just gonna put that on the other screen so I can see if anything, anyone says anything. Okay. Um, yes. So uh, let's get into, get into it. Uh, some background. So basically, this presentation is supposed to be like an introduction to this uh, field of binary exploitation, and it's aimed towards people who have some uh, programming and computer science uh, background. Uh, are interested in uh, security, uh, specifically uh, also having some uh, basic or maybe even intermediate understanding of some low-level language such, such as C or C++, and also uh, some basic understanding of uh, like how operating systems uh, work. Uh, so that's basically the um, prerequisites I'm kind of assuming here. Um, so. As I said, we're going to talk about uh, exploits. And uh, it could be just interesting to, to like take a moment to think about like what is an exploit in the in the context of like a computer uh, program. And uh, we typically uh, you know define an exploit as some kind of um, so some kind of uh, procedure that results in some unintended behavior uh, in this uh, program. Uh, if we think of our program as like a huge uh, state machine, uh, we have some initial state that the program starts in. And from there, it can go into various different uh, other states. So those states are like reachable from the initial state. Uh, and there will also be some of these states that you can reach, which we consider like invalid in, for some reason. Um, and these are the ones we associate with some kind of uh, bug in the program. And this doesn't have to be um, like dangerous or so it could just be like, you know, the program crashing or maybe like uh, um, 
causing uh, data to be uh, affected in, in in like an unintended way or something like just you know regular software uh, bugs uh, but specifically some of these like bugs uh, lead like enabled enables us to write these exploits uh, so uh, these are like this kind of like dangerous uh, subsets of this unintended bugs so um, this this is very context dependent but there are some um, effects that are kind of like always undesirable, like uh, allowing uh, someone to insert their own code into a program and execute that and do whatever they want is in most cases like something dangerous that we uh, want to avoid. Uh, however, this is of course complicated because like if you have services like, a, I don't know, like a cloud hosting provider, like their whole service is uh, you know, send us your code and we will execute it for you. So uh, it's always good to keep in mind that in most cases, a lot of these things are very like context dependent, but the mechanisms we're going to talk about um, are fairly like generic and applies in, in, in most of these uh, cases. Uh, anyway, so that was just like a little bit like philosophical uh, thoughts about like exploits and, and, and the vulnerabilities. Um, something that's very important to keep in mind when we're dealing, uh, especially when we're dealing with this like low level uh, stuff is how you think about data in, in a computer. So when we work with computer, we organize like bits into these uh, groups like nibbles, bytes, words, and so on. And these bits uh, are then interpreted as different uh, things. It could represent like uh, numbers, text, codes, images, uh, a pointer in memory to, to other memory, uh, and so on. And the important thing here is that the bits themselves, they carry no inherent meaning in, in the sense that like the, the, the data itself doesn't care or know if it represents like a number or a text or whatever, it's all about in which context it's being used. And that means that if you look at the uh, right side here and the, the top box, uh, these four lines represent four different ways that we can interpret this, the exact same uh, bits. So if we have so 32 bits like this, we could interpret that as uh, four, 8 bit uh, integers like 65, 66, 67, 68. Or we could interpret it as, as one ASCII encoded string with the letters A, B, C, D. Or we could interpret it as a sequence of uh, machine code uh, in x86 uh, representing these four instructions. Or we could interpret it as one big uh, 32 bit um, number. And, and like, before you know any context or anything, like none of these interpretations are like more correct or or so than any other. So it's just different interpretations of the same data. Uh, another thing to to keep in mind is uh, endianness. So when working with this, uh, we were, when working with numbers in the computer, uh, if they occupy more than one byte, uh, we typically store them as little endian which means that the least significant byte of the number is stored first in memory. So if you have this 32-bit uh, number, 44, 32, 33, 22, 11, it will be stored uh, as shown in, in memory. So this means that if you overwrite the first byte of a number, you will modify the least significant byte. So we'll just, you will modify the number by a small amount if it's little engine and vice versa if it's big engine. Uh, and as I said, we're talking about low level exploitation. There are like a lot of different types of like attacks and exploits uh, within uh, computer security. And here I have some kind of like hierarchy of, you know, uh, the different levels in some, in some sense. Uh, and there are basically uh, security considerations and attacks and exploits on like all of these levels essentially maybe not like on the physics level but uh you know there are these uh like side channel attacks on the like circuit level where you introduce um um glitches in like the signals on the physical circuits uh, that would be like a lower level than what we're talking about and then there is also like higher level stuff like um 
object deserialization attacks in like higher level languages and so on, which is also not what we're talking about. So we are talking about this like um, machine code running directly on the on the processor where will where will be we will be corrupting uh, the memory uh, of these programs to make these programs do something other than what was uh, intended. Okay, so. The things I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the concepts and the techniques and so on, they are fairly generic to this area, but to be able to give some like examples and talk around these examples, I will be talking about x86 uh, architecture. So um, just to have something to talk around and to demonstrate these uh, examples. But most of the ideas are like, uh, applicable in in a much broader uh, sense. So, um, in a computer, you have memory, and this memory is then organized in in some way. In a typical uh, program, you will have uh, some virtual memory uh, divided up in uh, a stack, a heap, and other like code and global variables. So, uh, the one thing that's very important to keep in mind here is the stack where a region of memory where we store a lot of um, stuff is it's an actual stack data structure you push and pop uh, things of it but the direction of the stack is um it, it goes from a high address to a low address. So the stack starts out, the top of the stack starts out at a high address. And then when you push things to the stack, the stack grows down to a lower address. So this is a bit unintuitive, but it's very important for all of, the, for all of these things I'm going to talk about to, to make sense. Um, so yeah, I will, I will remind you um, about this. And we will uh, first focus on these like stack related uh, things and look a little bit about uh, at things we can do with the heap. So uh, in x86, you have a bunch of registers um, where you can store information. Uh, you have some general purpose registers. And uh, you'll, by the way, have to excuse me. I'm kind of like updating these slides to use like 64-bit things, but I haven't found good images of everything. So there's like a slight discrepancy, but I think that you'll get the point anyway. Uh, so you have some general purpose registers where you can store uh, any any data you want. And then you have, uh, and so they are typically named A, B, C, D, uh, are four of them. And you have these uh, D, I, S, I, and this R8 and R9 uh, registers. Uh, but for for the purposes of, of what we're talking about, these are just like general registers wh where you can store uh, what, whatever you want. And then you have some special purpose uh, registers. And the important ones here uh, are the IP, BP, and SP uh, registers. So the ip register is the instruction pointer so it's always pointing at the next instruction to be executed in memory and uh, the base pointer bp uh, points at the base of the current stack frame and we will get back to that uh, later uh, so we're, when we will talk about it but uh, another important register is the stack pointer sp so the stack pointer is always pointing at the top of the stack and as i said before when we push things onto the stack the stack grows into a lower address so that means that when you push something onto the stack the stack pointer is decremented and it will take on a lower lower value than what it had before and when you pop something from the stack the stack pointer will increase in value and then there is like a whole bunch of other registers but they're not really relevant for for this um so when you write code, you typically divide your code up into uh, different uh, pieces, functions, and you can call these uh, functions from multiple places in your code. So you might have some function to uh, um, you know, add two numbers or whatever, and you can call that, uh, reuse that piece of code and call it from different places. So how does that mechanism of calling a function actually work uh, on the lower uh, level. Um, this can 
this is something that can be accomplished in many different ways. Uh, so you have something called a, a calling convention, which kind of sets up the like protocol for, for how you call a function and how you return back to where you came from. And this is, um, can, it can differ. I mean, it does differ from between like operating systems and uh, b between 32-bit and 64-bit and, and so on. So this is not like strictly tied to the architecture, but it's kind of like an extra uh, property uh, of uh, of the architecture or the the whole system as a whole. Um, so let's say you have the code um, on the top uh, right. Uh, where uh, the the left column is like what it actually what the instructions actually look like in in uh, in code, and then I have kind of like translated this into um, like pseudo instructions to the right. So we want to call a function which is located at this address cafe code, and what actually happens when you run this instruction call cafe code is that we'll, it will take the address of the next instruction that we want to execute when we come back. So where the three dots are, the address of that location is pushed onto the stack. And this is called the return address. So this is where we want to return to after we've finished executing. And then we jump to this location where we want to execute. And then at the end of this, uh, we want to return back. So we execute the return instruction. And what the return instruction does is, as you can see on the on the right side, is that it basically takes the top element of the stack, pops it into the back into the instruction pointer. Uh, and this is what it would look like in a 32-bit uh, setting. Uh, and the next example below is uh, what it would look like more in a in a 64-bit uh, settings setting. Uh, we might not be able to um call an absolute address here for example but it doesn't really matter where the code like exactly which uh, call variant we're using it still translates into the same thing we push the address of the next instruction that we want to execute after we return to the stack we jump to the code that we want to execute the code gets executed and at the end uh, there will be a return instruction which will pop the top element of the stack back into the instruction pointer. So that means we will return back into the location where uh, where we were before uh, executing or before calling the function. And uh, usually you also want to pass some arguments to your um, function. And in a 32-bit uh, 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 setting, uh, you do that by just pushing the all the arguments onto the stack in the reverse order they are listed. So Let's say we have the C code on the left side. We want to call this function F with arguments A and B. What we'll do then is we'll first push uh, the B argument to the stack, then we push the A argument to the stack, and then we execute this call uh, to F. In a 64-bit uh, context, you, you don't push uh, arguments to the stack unless you have a lot of arguments in which you also use the stack. But for uh, if you have a few number of arguments, they are passed in registers. So if you want to call this function again in a 64-bit context, you would uh, copy the first argument into the RDI register, and then the second uh, argument into the RSI register, and then you would call uh, the function. Um, so with that, in mind, we can now actually get on to the actual exploitation. So now we look a little bit at different uh, exploits centered around um, manipulating the stack and, and uh, the different objects you have uh, on the stack. Uh, any like questions or so so far or? Uh, yes, there was uh, one question. Uh, I'm Andreas from the DSC team, and uh, I will moderate the Q&A today. So uh, I will just read it out. So one person um, asked on Slido, um, when you go back to the last slide of the x86 uh, um, calling convention slide, um, we push um, after a function call, or, or when, when calling a function, we push uh, the register uh, EIP plus five or or the address EIP plus five um, to the stack. Why plus five and not um, plus four? 
because unless I have written a typo, the so the si the full size of the call cafe code instruction is five uh, bytes. Uh, you have one. Uh, when you do an absolute call like this, you have one byte for the opcode and four bytes for the uh, operand, the address. Mm. So, okay. uh, and I so, but this this addressing mode doesn't exist in 64-bit. Uh, that would be like a nine-byte instruction in that case. Uh, you can't do that in 64-bit. You can do uh, like a call relative to your current instruction pointer, which is why it's still five bytes even in the 64 uh, bit version because it's using a different mm. uh, different addressing mode for that instruction. Okay, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, then one other question was <laughs> about your uh, bio um, because there it said um, that you are part of the offensive security team at Google. So what exactly does uh, the offensive part mean? Yes, uh, I can probably talk more about it towards the end, but it's uh, basically the name of the internal uh, red team. So we carry out attacker simulations on, mm. on Google's network. So we pretend to be hackers, and then we try to hack into different uh, systems at Google. It's uh, related to like penetration testing, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we, we simulate attackers to kind of like expose internal weaknesses so that we can bring our findings to the other security teams and other product teams so that they can improve uh, the security. Um, but yeah, we can talk more about that uh, towards the end. I think. Yeah, sure. That, that sounds great. <laughs> so uh, that's it for now. So I think we can continue. Cool. So um, the first um, exploit uh, that we're going to talk about is the like simple stack buffer overflow uh, attack. So this happens when you have some uh, region of memory on the stack uh, of a specific size, and you try to basically write more uh, data uh, into this location than what fits. So you will write outside of uh, this buffer. And um, so consider the uh, function that we ha we have uh, on the top right, this like C-ish uh, function. So we might have some uh, local variable, uh, like a, a long integer, and then we have this 16-byte uh, buffer. And then we ask the um, user for, for some input into this buffer. And we don't limit this uh, input to the size of the buffer. And what can happen then is uh, if you consider like what the layout of the stack is when this uh, function is uh, running. So if you look at the middle left uh, box there, we will have this is like a, a part of the stack where you have this 16 byte buffer uh, on maybe on top of the stack. And then uh, below that, you have this eight bytes for this long integer uh, local variable. And then uh, on the stack, there will also be uh, a stored base pointer. And as I said, we'll talk more about this for now, so, but it's not really uh, important what it is. It's just you know, some eight byte value is on the stack, uh, which is not of importance to us at the moment. And then after that, we have this return address that we talked about. This is what was pushed onto the stack when we called the function. So what happens then if, uh, if we write more than 16 bytes onto this. Uh, the first 16 bytes that we input, they will end up in the buffer, no problem. The next eight bytes, because we will just continue writing here uh, on the stack. Because again, remember, as I said, like the top of the stack is at a lower address. So if you continue writing to a higher address, you go down the stack towards the elements below. Uh, so the next eight bytes will overwrite this local one variable. The next bytes, eight bytes after that, will overwrite this saved um, base pointer, and then the next eight bytes will overwrite the saved return address. So, uh, the memory—if we input like a sequence of letters, like to, uh, to the right—that's uh, what the memory layout of the stack will look like. And then, when we execute the return instruction at the end of the uh, function, we will instead of popping the real return address that was there before from the stack, we will pop this uh, JJJJKKKKK value uh, 
from the stack and put that into the instruction pointer. So effectively, we will jump, we will interpret these eight letters as a 64-bit number, as an address, and to try to go to that location and execute it. And most likely, this will be an invalid uh, address, and the program will crash, like uh, something like in the bottom uh, box. So. Uh, yeah, so this way we can get the program to crash. Uh, not super, super exciting yet. So how do, how do we turn this into uh, an attack? So we can have uh, something that's called uh, shell code, which is like a small piece of code. Um, typically, it launches launches a shell from where we can do other things. but And that's where the name comes from. But of course, it doesn't need to do specifically that. It can do like open like a connection to a remote server or just like delete a file or like it can do whatever you want. But the, the, the name shell codes is for like a small piece of code um, that you can like inject into uh, a program. So the code needs to be but typically, it needs to be like location independent. So all like addresses and stuff inside this piece of code needs to be relative to uh, the current location and so on, because we want this code to be able to execute uh, wherever uh, it ends up in memory. So ex we have an example to the right where uh, the top uh, box is like the uh, assembly instructions for launching uh, the slash bin slash sh program. And then the bottom box is just this assembled into a sequence of uh, bytes and machine code. So what we can do then is instead of inserting a bunch of uh, letters, we can insert our uh, this, this shell code uh, into this buffer. And then we can also overwrite the return address with the location of this buffer. So uh, this is like the, the most basic uh, buffer overflow attack. Uh, this is something you can do on a system with like no protection. So this is like the attack that you would do back in 1996. So this is absolutely not longer a, a viable attack, but it serves as like a starting point uh, and you know a good example of like the most basic attack we can do. So uh, what we're assuming here is that uh, there are basically no randomness in like the layout uh, of the memory. So we know where in memory this stack buffer will end up because back then the stack pointer would always start at the same address. And if the co program was executing like the same sequence of functions, we could know all the um, like pops and pushes to the stack. So we would know exactly where the stack was pointing at when we run this uh, piece of code. So what happens then is we inject our shell code, our sequence of uh, bytes, and then we align it so that um, if you look at the mid, uh, middle left box, you have the stack uh, structure again. We have these 16 bytes buffer, this eight byte variable, this eight byte other value, and then the eight byte return address. So this uh, shell code I showed previously, I think it's like 30 bytes or something. So we insert those uh, 30 bytes and then um, we pad out with like two bytes of whatever. And then, so then we have filled up exactly those first 32 bytes uh, so that the next thing coming up is the return address. And then finally, we uh, insert eight bytes, which represent this address of this um, uh, buffer in, in on the stack in memory. So that when the return address is, uh, sorry, the return instruction is executed at the end of the program, um, the program will not just like jump to a random location and crash, but specifically it will jump into this buffer on the stack and start executing the contents of this buffer as if it were code. Well, it is code. And then this will, will launch our shell and we would get uh, something like uh, the bottom example. So th there we have our like most basic um, buffer overflow uh, attack. And also note that let's say that the uh, the buffer was like a little bit too small like only 12 uh, bytes so that we only had like uh, 28 bytes uh, available to us our shell code wouldn't fit 
then we could just put it uh, further down the stack instead. Uh, and then just if we know that our buffer on top of the stack was at this like dead code address, we could just add the appropriate offset and overwrite with like a slightly higher value so that instead of jumping to the very top of the stack, we would jump to somewhere further down the stack and execute uh, our code. Um, and additionally, uh, there might be cases where you know roughly where the buffer is located, but maybe not exactly. Maybe it's like the program can take like a few different paths and there might be like a little bit of um, leeway and like how many pushes and pops and stuff there's been to the stack. And what you can do then is you can, because we have this issue now, because we have this uh, nice uh, code of like 30 bytes, but for it to function correctly, we need to start executing exactly on the first byte, this uh, OX48, because if we start, before it, there will be some other bytes there, which will probably be interpreted as something completely not what we want, and it might crash. And if we jump too, uh, too far ahead, we will end up somewhere in the middle of our code, and it will not do what we want. So to get around this, we can just prepend our code with uh, a sequence of uh, no op or nop uh, instructions. And then we give ourselves some more leeway, because then we just need to hit anywhere in that um, section of no op instruction and we'll just continue executing the no ops until it reaches our actual code and execute that and this is called a, a nop sled so you kind of you can imagine it being like a small slope and you like you land somewhere on the slope and you just slide down to the code that you want to execute um okay so and let's talk about some uh protections against this. So one protection that was in, uh, introduced um, about 20 years ago was uh, address space layout randomization, or ASLR. So the idea here is that every time you uh, start a program, the uh, because we're dealing with virtual uh, memory in an operating system, the um, address of uh, the stack and the heap uh, are randomized. So the stack pointer will have a different value every time you start uh, your program. And uh, the location of the base of the heap will also have a different value every time you start uh, your program. And on a 64-bit system, it would be about 28 bits uh, of uh, randomness uh, for this, which is uh, typically uh, good enough for, for the context that this is typically relevant. And even like the 12 bits of randomness on, on a 32-bit system is mostly uh, sufficient for, for most of the context where this is relevant. So the problem now with our attack is that we can still uh, inject our code into the, onto the stack, but we don't know where this buffer is located. So uh, we cannot overwrite the return address with the correct pointer to jump to this location and execute it. Um, so what we can do then instead is kind of like reuse code that's already inside of the program. Because at this point, the location of all the code in memory is still on, at a fixed uh, address. So what we can do is we can take, we can let's say there is an instruction somewhere in the program, there is this instruction jump to the stack pointer. And we will know where in memory this instruction is. So instead of jumping directly to our buffer, we can uh, ret jump uh, to this uh, piece of code in memory. And then that will execute. And the stack pointer will be now be pointing at our um, code. And then we'll jump there and execute it. So we kind of like use the code that's already in memory as a trampoline to get us uh, to execute uh, the code that we have injected. And this small piece of code that's already existent in, in memory, that, that's uh, we call that a, a gadget. And there will be more of those uh, in the next step. So then also around 20 years ago, there was this other protection introduced called NX or DEP, uh, Data Execution Prevention. And the idea here is that you add kind of like permission bits to uh, sections of memory. 
So you can say that a, a, a one area of the memory is readable and executable. So like the code, for example, and uh, other pieces of, of memory can be readable and writable, but not executable. So this is typically how the stack is marked, for example. So now the problem is that even if we know where, um, uh, where the stack buffer is, uh, if we inject code there, it still can't be executed because the stack is is marked as not being able to be executed. So you cannot execute code in the stack. The program will just crash instead. But now we can like uh, think about this idea of like reusing code that's already in, in memory instead. So consider uh, a situation where you have these two pieces of code somewhere uh, in memory, this pop EAX and then a ret instruction, and this other pop EBX, pop ECX, and then a ret instruction. Um, we can then use these as kind of like building blocks to, to like set up our own kind of like pseudo programming language with very uh, odd instructions. Uh, so the way you do this is that you overwrite uh, the stack again, as we did before. First, there is some uh, stuff, in the, stuff in the beginning of the stack that we don't really, don't really care about. Also note that we don't know where in memory this is, but we can write to it uh, anyway. Uh, so what you do then is you set up this sequence of values that would kind of like drive this execution. So the first value is here is this, um, address that ends with 4a. So when the return instruction uh, of the uh, function that we are attacking, it's still the same example uh, function you can imagine from before. It will return back to this location in memory where you have this pop eax return instruction. So it will execute that part, which will pop this dead beef value into the eax register and then execute another return, which will then pop this 6a address uh, into the instruction pointer and jump to the second uh, small piece of code, which will pop ebx and ecx. So that will pop the cafe babe and feed food values into the ebx and ecx uh, registers. So I hope that you can see that like by finding these like small bits and pieces of code uh, scattered around the memory that ends with this uh, return uh, instruction, we can set up this chain on the stack where we kind of like mix um, addresses, which kind of then represent operations, like calls to these different gadgets. And then we kind of like uh, interleave that with these uh, values that we want to populate our different registers and so on with. Uh, and by doing this, you kind of build this kind of like a, like a program on the stack, but it's not program in the sense that it's actual code that's being executed by the processor. It's a program in the sense that each of these represent an address that you will return to execute those instructions uh, and then move on to the next piece in the chain. And this way, we can just reuse this, this different pieces of code in memory uh, to do uh, what we're after. And uh, this thing, uh, this concept is called return-oriented programming or ROP. So this, and this, uh, sequence of value that we set up is called a ROP chain. So um, now we haven't injected any code of our own at all. We're just in, uh, inserting addresses to existing code and values to be used with that code. Uh, another protection is uh, stack guard. Uh, it has also different names like stack canary, stack uh, cookies, and so on. But the concept uh, is the same. The idea here is that we want to, because all of these attacks we've seen before, they kind of like uh, rely on the fact that we managed to overwrite this stored return address on the stack. And uh, we want to prevent that from happening in the first place, or at least we want to be able to detect that and securely abort the uh, um, execution of the program. So the way this works is that when the program is started, the program generates a secret value, which is stored in like a global variable. And basically, the compiler will also transform your code uh, during compilation. So this vulnerable function that we had on the top left will be kind of uh, transformed into uh, what it looks like on the right. This is kind of my pseudo code thing, where at the beginning of the uh, execution of the function, the program will push this secret value to the stack after it has 
push this like return address and base pointer. And then at the end, just before it's going to execute the return instruction, it will compare this location on the stack with this global uh, uh, variable again and check that they are still matching. And if they don't, that means that we have somehow overwritten memory on the stack and uh, that's bad and the program will just crash in a controlled uh, manner instead. So the uh, the effect of having overwritten the return address will never actually be like realized. So um, yeah, so if you look at like the, the stack layout in the middle there, uh, you could see like we have our different values on the top, then the secret value, and that gets overwritten with if we just input a bunch of uh, values, uh, we will overwrite the stack value. And right before the return instruction is called, this uh, check is performed, and we see that this 4141 value is not the same as the secret value, which we don't know. And therefore, the program will just terminate uh, instead, and you will get an output like um, the bottom uh, box. And this whole protection relies on the fact that we don't know the secret value. So if we manage to use some other vulnerability to like leak parts of the memory where this uh, piece of code, piece of data is located, and we we get to know the secret value, then the pro protection breaks because then we can just overwrite the secret value with itself, and then it will not be detected because then it will not have been modified. Another interesting situation where it breaks is you, if you have a server that forks off and you're trying to exploit it uh, because that if you have a forking process it will just copy like the memory so that the secret value will be the same in each fork so each time you uh, try to exploit it the secret value will stay the same and this is an issue because then you can basically guess it one byte at a time so you make 256 different uh, guesses for the first byte and the one that doesn't crash that's the correct value for the first byte. And then you do this another 256 times and so on. Uh, so uh, you only have to do this a few thousand times instead of uh, you know, many billions uh, of times uh, to get the correct uh, value. Um, so basically security relies on the fact that it's random at every program start and that it's secret. And if these things uh, break, then the protection break. <clears throat> Yes, uh, another type of exploit, which is actually not related to, to um, stack uh, exploits, but I didn't like think it, it, it deserved like a whole own section. But anyway, uh, when you use uh, libraries in your program, if you have a dynamically linked uh, program, so you import functions from like the C standard library or some other library and so on, the way this works is that you have a table called uh, the GOT, the Global Offset Table, which contains uh, addresses of all the different uh, functions in the different libraries that you want to use. So when the program starts, the uh, loader will uh, check which libraries you require, load those libraries into memory, and then it will check which of the functions you want in each library, and it will fill out this Global Offset Table with all the addresses of those uh, library functions. So that when you call, let's say like the printf function, what happens is that you call like a small stub function inside of your program, uh, which looks like the second box where it will just look it at this table in the correct location and it will jump to this uh, address. So another exploitation technique here is like if you manage to overwrite the entries in this table, uh, then you can control where you jump to if you call these functions. So if you manage, for example, to overwrite the entry for the printf in the global offset table, the next time you call printf for any reason, it will not actually call printf, but instead the, it will jump to the address that you uh, wrote there. So that's like another um, category of, of exploits. And this like, little stub function is, is located in what's called the PLT, the program linkage table. Uh, so this is this mechanism to do like dynamic uh, linking uh, of, of um, code. Um, and there's a protection against this called uh, RELRO or relocation read only. So there are two variants of this. Uh, there's a very weak one called the partial RELRO. The only thing this does, it places the global offset table before any global variables in memory. So that means that if you have a 
some kind of buffer in a global variable and you have an overflow in that one, it can't overflow into the global offset table because the global offset table is always located on a lower address. It's a fairly weak uh, protection. Uh, and it, the much better protection is what's called the full rel row, which means exactly what the name implies that uh, the global offset table is read-only memory. So the linker at the beginning at startup, it will load the program, fill out all of these addresses, and then we will switch that region, region of memory to be read-only so that it, uh, you can't uh, write, uh, write to it anymore. And this uh, defeats this uh, attack, of course, because you can no longer overwrite the entries. Um, I see we are a little bit short on time, so I will actually skip over these last few entries and go over to the heap uh, stuff. Uh, I think I will, uh, we, we can make these slides available, I guess, uh, so, so that uh, you can look at them uh, afterwards and there will be links to resources uh, and so on. Uh, so you can look more into these other things. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the heap uh, before before the end. Um, so we've talked about the stack. The stack is a very structured piece of uh, memory. You have like a top, it grows, it shrinks, like the stack data structure. The heap is uh, more like a generic memory area where you can like create and remove uh, objects uh, in any order uh, you want. And to be able to manage this, you have, like in your computer, you have the actual physical memory, which is then handled by like the operating system and creates this uh, virtual uh, memory layout. And the programs can request memory from the operating system one page at a time. And a page is typically like four kilobytes or so of memory. Uh, but that's quite a lot because you typically don't create like four kilobytes objects every time you create something in memory. So what you then have on top of that is a memory allocator which is responsible for like chopping this uh, memory up into small pieces and hand out to the program uh, when it want, when it needs uh, memory and also keeping track of what memory is in use and what is not and so on. So for example, in C, you have the malloc and free uh, functions uh, which uh, calls into this memory allocator and you tell malloc like, I want uh, 16 bytes of memory or, I have now finished using my 16 bytes of memory here. You can have it back and mark them as available. And there are tons of different implementation of this. This is like a research area to like create the most performant uh, like memory allocator because you want to uh, like utilize the memory in the best way possible and consider like fragmentation and locality and so on. So there are a bunch of different imp implementations. For example, the uh, glibc has one Im implementation. There's another one called like uh, GE malloc. And uh, typically you would see um, like computer games would typically use like their own memory allocators because they want to like have them tuned for a specific type of usage to get the most uh, performance and so on. But anyway, we can uh, perform attacks on, on the heap. And these attacks, I broadly divide up into kind of like two categories. We can kind of like attack this on the kind of like application layer or like the specific uh, related to the specific program that you are uh, attacking. And this is then, of course, very context dependent. But uh, typically in your in your program, you might have uh, some mechanism that creates um, objects uh, in memory that are placed on the heap. And then you will have references to these uh, objects. And it's very important then that the program makes sure that if they actually free a piece of memory, it will actually also make sure that there are no longer any references pointing to this uh, piece of uh, memory, because otherwise you will get what's called a use after free bug, where you might, might end up in a situation where you allocate some memory, have a pointer to that memory, um, you free that memory, but you don't reset the pointers. You still have a pointer to this memory. And then another part of the code uh, asks for some memory and gets assigned this free memory. And now you have two pointers pointing into the same region of memory. Uh, and this can cause then issues where maybe like one of the uh, pieces of code is like writing memory, uh, writing data into this piece of memory, which is interpreted in a different way 
uh, by the other part of the code, which is still using this uh, piece of memory, even though it shouldn't, because it told the memory allocator that it was done with it. Uh, and here you can get uh, things like something being interpreted as like a text field by one part of the code and as a, fun a function pointer in another part of the code, leading to this kind of exploitation where you control a, a pointer that you're calling into and jump into some some piece of code that you want to execute. Uh, sometimes you might do what's called like heap spraying if you don't know exactly. You, maybe you know that there's some piece of code, a uh, piece of uh, memory that's being freed up, and you want to make sure that this newly allocated thing is also in that same location. So you might like do something to allocate like a whole bunch of objects and just hope that one of them will be in the correct location. This is typically something you will see in like modern exploits, like in browsers and uh, and so on to like because there are a lot, a lot of uh, protections and, and things to to consider there. The other kind of like broad category category of of things to consider is like to attack like the allocator itself, because the memory memory allocator will have it will keep a lot of like bookkeeping data. Uh, all of these pieces of memory they will be kept in like different memory uh, structures like linked lists and so on um, to. Uh, keep track of like what's available and do this in a performant uh, way and if you have like certain types of like over uh, overflows and so on you might be able to like corrupt these internal data structure of the memory allocator so these like linked lists of uh, chunks of data and so on uh, might get corrupted and this can also lead to certain uh, types of attacks and um, specifically for like the uh, glibc there's been like a whole collection of tags called like house of something so there's like a whole collection of like house of orange house of something uh, which explains like a specific attack on like uh, some uh, aspect of the glibc uh, memory allocator um there will be links to this as well so as suggested, what I'm what I'm saying, like most of these um, like attacks on the heaps, like it's very context dependent. So I won't go more into depth on that now. It's something that you can, you know, uh, look up more uh, further afterwards. Um, but yeah, so these this was like a quick introduction to like some memory memory corruption and like binary exploitation uh, techniques. So if you think this is interesting and you want to like try this out and like learn more um what can you do um so one thing i would suggest is uh playing uh ctf or capture the flag competition or war games uh where you have these uh challenges where you have these vulnerable programs that you're supposed to exploit and uh, the good thing with this is that it is like a nice controlled setting where you have like a specific problem that you know there is a specific solution to and you can also start out with these attacks um which are like maybe not like actually viable in the real world anymore. So like you know, starting out by trying to like exploit Chrome or something might not be like the the best way to start out. But maybe to start with something that would have worked uh, 20 years ago, and then uh, you know work your way uh, forward. So I can highly recommend uh, playing like CTF and uh, CTF competition as and war games. So war games is basically the same as CTF, but it's like not like a time boxed event. It's more like a website where you can go and just pick a challenge and play it um, anytime you want. So there's some links here. So we at Google host our own uh, CTF competition every year um, in the summer or, or fall. And uh, you can also go to the ctftime.org to, to uh, check the schedule. There's also this newly formed CTF players discord, which you can join and talk about CTF competitions. Uh, there's also some like learning materials I would recommend. Um, I've created this website, securitycreators.video, which is like a index page of like people creating uh, video content related to like security. So some of these will have a lot of content related to uh, binary exploitation. Uh, so I have my colleague uh, Ginvel, who has a popular YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel on my own of my own where where I do some CTF challenges on. Um, there's also like live overflow, which I'm probably have heard of um yeah also some links to like um further reading uh, this pwn college uh, is really nice it's actually like a university course uh, but it's also like available as like a you know self-paced uh, studying thing with like lectures and challenges and everything uh, on this website so it's a really great thing you should check out 
And if you are interested in Google, you should definitely check out like our students career page where you can find like full-time positions and internships. Uh, if you're interested in internships, I think you should hurry up because uh, the like deadlines will be very soon, I think. And again, if you have more like after this presentation, like specific questions to me about what it is like working at Google and specifically what it's like working with security at Google, uh, feel free to, to reach out. Um, yeah, so that's what I had. Uh, thank you for listening. And maybe even though maybe we could have time for some questions, even though we are actually on over time, but yeah. Yes, sure, great. Uh, and thank you, Carl, for this interesting presentation. Uh, it was uh, really nice to see all these special mitigations of uh, potential exploits. And we do have quite some questions. And um, yeah, as I said before, I will moderate uh, the Q&A. And um, yeah, I'm just going to read out the questions you asked on uh, Slido. Um, but feel free to unmute yourself uh, if you want to uh, ask questions in person, because it's usually a bit nicer for our speakers. Uh, so um, one question was, um, how do you attack systems where you don't know the code or stack layout? Because uh, in the previous slides, you always showed the code before and how this works. So how does this work in practice? Do you have like code samples when you attack Google internal systems or is it just trial and error? So uh, in most cases, actually, so you in most cases, you probably need the code to be able to create a, a, an exploit, especially if we're talking about actual like real life targets because they're so complex. However, this is typically not as big of a um, like hindrance that you would imagine. Like getting a hold of uh, copies of programs and so on is, I mean, uh, First of all, a lot of people use like commercial off the shelf software, which you can just like download or buy or whatever. And uh, for other cases, there might be like leaked leaks, or maybe as part of your attack, you manage to get hold of a copy of the program and so on. So uh, typically you don't find exploits if you don't have the, the binary. So typically you don't need the actual source code. Uh, you can have just the compiled binary and like decompile it and, and disassemble it and, and analyze it to find the vulnerabilities. Uh, but you most likely will need that, except in like very rare um, circumstances. And uh, there was a part of that related to how we actually do it. Uh, so, Sorry, yeah, what was that last, last part of the, of the question? It was... uh, if it's just trial and error in, in real life, but I think you, you already kind of answered this. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so another question is, uh, what's the difference between binary exploits and malware programs, or how are they related? So malware uh, is, most malware is like, regular software designed to do like specific tasks but the way malware can be delivered to a system can be through an exploit so uh let's say we have uh let's say we found a, a vulnerability in in chrome so we managed to develop an exploit in chrome and the exploit and this is what i was talking to a little bit about like the context and so on like the exploit itself that might give us like the ability to just like um, run any command on the computer. Uh, but then we might then use that to like download and install a piece of malware on that machine to uh, maybe get more um, a, a nicer control of this and more stable uh, control of that uh, system or more, more persistent control of that system or and so on. So like an exploit is more of like a, a, a delivery mechanism. And then what you do once you finally exploited something that can be many different things, including like installing a malware. So malware is typically more, depending on what type of malware, if it's like ransomware, or maybe it's just like remote control software, that's more like, you know, what's called like TeamViewer or VNC or whatever. That would be many types of malware is more like regular software like that, but designed for a specific purpose. Okay, nice, thanks. So uh, as far as I understand, just to wrap that up, this up, um, like, an exploit is basically kind of the entry gate into a system, and then you can install malware to like control it 
in a in a more convenient manner. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so um, you presented a, a whole bunch of uh, different protection mechanisms, uh, especially for like um, stack based. Um, yeah, stack-based attacks or exploits. And do they, or can you say some some words about if they um, do add some runtime overhead for systems for the program when it's executed? Because they seemed very efficiently implemented, but just uh, someone is very curious here. Yes, uh, they do. Uh, it, it varies, of course. Uh, so uh, depends on kind of like how they're implemented. So for example, this, the, the stack cookie thing, that's entirely in software, right? It's just this uh, something that the compiler, uh, it's like features that the compiler adds on to your code. Uh, so that will, of course, add some, some runtime uh, overhead. But uh, in most real life, Context, it's you know not some not something that you need to 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 care about. Uh, other uh, protections are implemented like in hardware or like lower lower uh, parts of, of like the tech stack, and they might provide less um, uh, or like cost less overhead. But this was if you remember this uh, if you saw this whole like. Um, uh, Spectre uh, and this uh, whole discussion around those uh, security vulnerabilities. Uh, there, you had the issue where where those uh, mitigations actually cost uh, quite a lot of performance uh, overhead because you had to disable uh, quite a lot of optimizations and stuff. Uh, so, uh, for these specific uh, protections I talked about, the uh, overhead is not something to worry about. But of course, in general, it's definitely something to consider. Okay, nice, interesting. Um, and then uh, coming coming like um, to to your yeah job at Google again. So how often do you successfully hack some Google system? Um, not sure if you are allowed to share something about this, but uh, that would be very interesting. It's the highest upvoted question. Yeah, uh, I mean I can of course not uh, share specifics, but. Of course, like when you have a company the size of Google or any company of any size, basically, you know, there will be um, vulnerabilities, there will be misconfigurations uh, and so on. So, uh, of course, uh, we managed to to break into stuff. And, and like, you know, the fact that we still that we do have a red team or offensive security team, like in the first means that like we are because like if we had managed to solve all of the security problems ever, then there would be no need for us, right? So uh, of course uh, we managed to to uh, break into things. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, so yeah, I mean that that happens regularly, but of course uh, we also have kind of like we are kind of cheating a little bit. That we have like a unique insight into like the internals of Google's and so on. So. It's also not the, necessarily the case that just because we did it, you know, any random outsider could do it. But it's always better to give your like uh, imaginary enemy, like us, more power, and then protect yourself against that than to like underestimate your uh, opponents. Sure. Nice. Uh, and personal question: Are you like exploiting systems that run in production, or do you have like uh, dedicated deployments just for attacks? Uh, no, so we we uh, we go all over the, the all over the place. Like any basically uh, <laughs> basically anything goes within. So we have like a rules of engagement, like what we're allowed to do and not to do. And of course, uh, we have to to stick within that. And of course, like you know, respect the law, for example, and so mm -hmm. on. But uh, yeah, absolutely, we we are on uh, you know. Uh, Regular like like uh, employees' computers, the test system, production system doesn't doesn't really matter. Of course, there are like very strict uh, protocols about like um, to, to like make sure that none of the like user uh, data is uh, endangered uh, in any way. Yeah, sure. um, so so uh, but yeah, there is no specific like test environment. So this is actually like one of the things that might like differentiate maybe like a red team from like a penetration test, where like a penetration test might be more about like finding as many flaws as possible in maybe like a single system or like a single uh, uh, section of the company or whatever. While the red teaming is more about like uh, accomplishing one or like a predefined goal with like 
using any methods necessary. So for example, if I find some kind of like privilege escalation vulnerability or something, uh, I use that to elevate my privileges and then I move on to like the next step of my attack. While someone doing like a penetration test, they find that they are not sati- they, they will not be satisfied with that. They will look for five more privilege, uh, privilege escalation uh, attacks in the same uh, system because so that's kind of like it's it's about going like going wide versus going deep kind of thing maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, uh, thanks a lot for, for answering this question and uh, interestingly this was or the difference between penetration testing team and like your red team job uh, was one of the other questions as well. Um, so yeah. this is already answered now I guess. Mm, yeah, I, um, I could, I could, I could, of course, just like expand, uh, like just very shortly on that as well. So, sure, uh, go ahead. for if, if we're talking about like Google specifically, for example, we have then other security teams who work more with that. So they more do more like security reviews of uh, specific systems. Like when the engineers like build uh, systems and improve uh, products and so on, there will be like security reviews where you will have a security engineer going through, and and then there it's more about like you know going through the system, going through the code, like trying to find every imaginable vulnerability while what we are doing is more like we want to find one vulnerability that does what we want to like put these together into one chain that like enables us to accomplish our goal okay, nice. Nice. Um, um, yeah uh, lucas was asking um if there are any research areas that you are personally particularly interested in or that you could point out so I I wouldn't maybe say like research areas. Like in general, I really like like reverse engineering and like uh, analyzing programs and so on. And I think it's really interesting what people are trying to do, like more and more like automated things like that. So uh, in the past few years, um, like uh, fussing is like the, the big hot uh, thing. I'm not an expert in that. I, I it's really something that I should get into more and and and, and look more into. Uh, but I have unfortunately not really been going like too deep into like actual like research or like bleeding edge uh, stuff in, in, in general. Okay, nice. Uh, and speaking of fussing, uh, one question was actually: um, Do you feel like it's harder nowadays to get a good job in uh, security or especially in binary exploitation security? Um, versus getting a job, a job when um, like writing bug finding programs for or like referring to fuzzers, for example, like is it harder nowadays to get a job there? I, I like if this is a question about like are, are the fuzzers taking our jobs? I, I think the answer I, I is no, so. <laughs> uh, okay. not yet, not yet. Um, most there are very few companies. Uh, which are doing fussing to any uh, relevant uh, level, um, so uh, like so far, uh, it's still uh, fairly early, and like it's like research area, and like people at large, well-funded companies, or like maybe specific like startups or whatever, focusing on those things. Uh, I also think like even if you built like even if you built the like perfect fusser or whatever that would find like every exploit or every vulnerability in a single program, you still wouldn't be without a job because that's not all there is to uh, security. Like in our, in many of our exercises, we don't uh, we don't really use any like actual vulnerabilities. In, in, in programs, it might be just like you know, misconfigurations, uh, wrong assumptions, um, human error, and so on. So like, uh, yeah, I think like either, however you slice that question, the answer is still no, uh, yeah. Okay, nice, interesting. Uh, and one last question um, regarding internships. Uh, do you have internships or are you offering internships uh, in the offensive team? And if you do, do you require some uh, knowledge in the security area beforehand? And what kind of tasks would uh, intern do there? Yeah, so uh, we offer internships in the like in the security organization of Google, but I'm fairly certain we 
don't take interns in the offensive security team specifically because the sensitive nature of what we're doing. Uh, but we have a lot of other teams within the security uh, organizations uh, taking uh, interns. So there's a lot of different things within security uh, that you can work with, that you can do internships with. Uh, I think some examples from last year, we had people uh, like, implementing uh like better like frameworks for our like developers when doing like web applications to like automatically apply certain security features we had people uh doing uh, like sandboxing uh projects like building like libraries and tools for like uh sandboxing programs uh people doing internships doing like security reviews of uh, stuff and like there's been a lot of different uh so th there's a lot of different types of of uh, intern uh projects but i think specifically our team do not take um interns okay uh, thanks a lot for answering this question. Uh, and just one one last question came just in, and I really like how philosophically this this question is phrased. But I think it has a real uh, business background. So if a bug is found by you or your team, and it is not truly exploitable, do you still care, or what is the process? Do you do you fix this bug, or like yeah? Yeah. Um, I asked almost that question to my manager today mm -hmm. uh, but essentially yes we care about anything that made life easier for us as an attacker uh, so that ranges from like straight up vulnerabilities uh, to like misconfigurations but it could also be things like okay so we uh, could kind of like abuse this feature of this program to perform this task uh wouldn't it be nice if maybe you couldn't do that like just different maybe making changes to uh, features in different products or adding extra uh protection mechanisms and that those are all also like things that we bring up in our like reports and findings and um another thing is like uh providing um things that our kind of like detection team can use to build and improve our detection mechanism because it might be the case that like okay this thing that we have here it's not realistic to uh you know change this or maybe not it's it, maybe it's not even desired to change maybe this is like working as intended but maybe we want to add just like a monitoring thing so that if this happens a lot then there should be someone looking at it or it's like it's a very like it's definitely not like binary uh if it's something is like good or bad or like a vulnerability or not or if you can do more things so yeah definitely we a lot of our work is like coming up with things that would have made life harder for ourselves in our attacks okay nice uh, thanks for sharing this insight uh, and yeah, that's uh, it with questions as far as I see. So um, yeah, a big thank you again for this very interesting presentation. Um, also uh, to everyone or to the audience, so thanks for joining and to everyone on YouTube, um, because yeah, the, the majority of our viewers was actually on YouTube. Thanks for upvoting our stream. Um, yeah, and um, uh, we so of course, we still have some, some events coming up, so make sure to join them as well, and we will see you there. And make sure to also share our uh, yeah, events on social media when you see them. And yeah, thanks a lot for that. Also, again, thanks a lot to Carl, our speaker. And yeah, have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.